Hello, welcome again to Sports and Luck. Joining me, Rob Harris from Sky News as ever, Martin Ziegler from The Times and Tariq Panja from The New York Times. Freshly, hopefully recovered from the Olympics, although quite a bit still to get into from the wash-up from Paris, including the big vacancy created with uh, Thomas Barr announcing his IOC departure. Ziggs, any interest? You're a man of the sports world. Well, you know, waiting for a phone call. Um, I'm considering it, I think, perhaps. Refuse to rule out. Campaign wait. managers here, Rob. Well, it's <coughs> something to get into is uh, all the documents limiting how much of a role comms people can play. Maybe not good news for that industry. Also, you'd have to be dealing with a lot of doping cases, and that seems to be the fallout from the games, including allegations of hypocrisy still flying around China versus US. Yeah, uh, there's that, and also other cases involving the gymnastics at the Olympics. The Olympics are over but the stories seem to run and run. Just like the Premier League, it seems like the season's almost never ended, given all the battle through the summer. Yeah, um, about to kick off again for the new season. And actually, this season is going to go on and on and on because we've got the new Club World Cup at the end of it, haven't we? Um, so we've had the, the Euros short break into the new season. And then this is going to be another lengthy season. Maybe an asterisk season. Another another asterisk season, maybe. Uh, God damn it, is, they're piling, aren't they, these cases? Yeah, um, we'll get into that later. There's lots of stuff around Manchester City and there's certain other Premier League cases bobbing over Chelsea, Leicester City, Everton. And for all that scrutiny, some of the Premier League might think, at least they're not France or Italy, who've been struggling to sell the TV rights throughout the summer as well. But... So much in depth to get into. As the Olympics was ending, came the announcement of the death of Issa Hayatu, former president of the Confederation of African Football, a former FIFA vice president for many years, and of course, the acting FIFA president between Sepp Blatter being forced out of office towards the end of 2015, and then Gianni Infantino being elected FIFA president in February of 2016 died at the age of 77 in Paris, where the Olympics were taking place, having been receiving dialysis for kidney problems. Obviously, many tributes to Issa Hayatu, the person, but quite a mixed record in terms of his sports role, growing African football, but subject to many investigations at times. Yeah, just in terms of his illness, he's had the kidney problems for... For a long time, even during the end of his period at CAF and at FIFA, the he's obviously a man of his time as well. If you think about that era and some of the listeners who are familiar with these names, Julio Grondona, Sepp Blatter, you mentioned, Nicolas Leos, they're the big kind of beasts of FIFA in the past. Hayatu was the main, one of the main men. And, and certainly, if you're looking at these reforms, after those arrests, following FIFA Gate or the FIFA scandal of 2015. Rob, you mentioned that he was the acting president. And those reforms, those much-needed reforms, FIFA under pressure, he was the guy in charge. And like you could all say, look, they've kind of ignored them all now. But those reforms passed as as he was in charge briefly. Yeah, it's not here too. It was an interesting character. I thought I first came across him when he was effectively chosen um, by... UEFA to be the, the man that they wanted to uh, get behind to try and replace Sepp Blatter in 2002. And there was a, a presidential general uh, election. I had to, he lost quite badly. He couldn't even get uh, the majority of the African countries to vote for him, despite being the head of the, the head of, of CAF. But uh, he, he seemed then a sort of fairly genuine guy, and he, he did manage to avoid a lot of the... Um, really serious allegations. I mean, he was sanctioned or reprimanded by the IOC for accepting um, 100,000 French francs, which at the time was about £10,000, to go towards his birthday celebrations, I think it was. I think it was at a time when the you know, money was thrown around with not much governance. So he, he was never seriously targeted with the sort of corruption allegations around Russia or Qatar and managed to sort of hang on in his uh, his position. What was once named in a British parliamentary hearing around cash for votes for the 2022 World Cup for Qatar and that vote in December 2010. He then discussed it in December 2015 while acting FIFA president and he said, I would not be here at FIFA if I was corrupt. 
Can the parliament prove that I have had 1.5 million? I have never received one single dollar or euro from anyone to vote for anybody. Yeah, he did say that. I mean, the uh, Pedra Al Majid, who was the sort of uh, Qatar whistleblower, she told a documentary in 2022 um, that was screened by Netflix that um, the Qatar World Cup bid offered three African FIFA committee members, including Hayatu, $1.5 million each. So she, she went on the record as saying that. Um, and it was take, that offer was made at a meeting in Luanda, Angola in 2010, which was sponsored by the Qatar World Cup bid. Interestingly, his 29-year rule of uh, the Confederation of African Football did end in 2017. Had he fallen out of favour then with the new guard? Because, of course, it was Ahmed Ahmed of Madagascar who won that election. And there was all of a sense that, was it that Gianni Fantino was uh, favouring Ahmed? I think um, you don't have to call it speculation. Gianni Infantino was favouring Ahmed Ahmed. They clearly had a, a favourite. They got the guy in that they wanted. Look, if you look at what's happened to CAF, those corruption allegations, by the way, are really serious and, and, and they must be considered when you look at Hayatu in the whole. But if you look at CAF and the disintegration of CAF following Hayatu's departure, I don't know if the two are connected. Ahmed Ahmed was a complete disaster. The, the finances of CAF have essentially collapsed. There's been reports that the current general secretary, Veron Mosengo Omba, is under investigation there, a school friend of Gianni Infantino. Everywhere you look at it, CAF is in a far unhealthier state than it was. As someone who's been on this podcast, journalist and Times has been a FIFA insider, Sue Obayawana said, actually, Hayatu, when he took over CAF in 1988, the organization could barely boast of $1 million in its bank account. When he left in 2017, there was $150 million in there and a guaranteed $1 billion in further income. And, you know, he talked about how he was a man who fought for dignity and interest of African world football politics, never tolerated respect uh, said his biggest mistake was not bowing out on his own terms and handing over power you know and the fact he did lead with an iron grip now slightly confusingly the fifa website in 2021 does reference how he was banned for a year by the ethics committee over breaching the code over duty of loyalty now what is less clear because it's not on the fifa website is then the following year it was actually overturned this ban which in, was in connection with the sale of african tv rights and failing to apparently abide by his necessary duties by neglecting a rival bid but uh, it was did found eventually there was insufficient evidence of course this hayati's death announced as the paris olympics was drawing to a close just a a written statement from FIFA, flags flown at half mast in Zurich. And uh, interestingly, Thomas Bach not mentioning Hayatu in his closing press conference, although there was in the IOC session over the weekend in Paris. Yeah, there was. He obviously was an IOC member for a long time as well. That wasn't the only kind of activities off the field happening in Paris. There were lots of meetings taking place during the Olympics. Some might be quite significant. Yeah, the FIFA office was very busy. There was a whole succession of meetings taking place. Gianni Fantina meeting an entire procession of uh, Federation heads and then in the final days of the games it looked like a sales pitch for the Club World Cup although the clip posted on his Instagram was more about the Women's World Cup although you could see the Club World Cup there very clearly on stage and it seemed like it was the attempt to finally find some backers of this new men's tournament next summer in the United States. Yeah, so this is the FIFA office or, or the party office, essentially, the annex for the Olympics. They, they hired a bigger one in, in uh, Place de Concorde near where the, uh, the people who were there might remember the BMX venues and stuff, but a very fancy part of Paris. And there was a day there where the TV, where the broadcasters and sponsors were brought in to sort of meet and greet Janny and to talk about, you know, what's to come. And one of the, one of the issues was this Club World Cup. What do we know? Not much. So we have still no sponsors announced for that, no stadiums announced, and then a very late announcement in the last month or so of a TV rights tender. But one of the funny lines I heard from people who were there was Gianni Infantino told them to enjoy the food and then said, 
it might be a bit better if you pay us some more money. I think that was a joke, but but you know that's that's where they are. I did see uh, Infantino on the way into the closing ceremony on Sunday, although he seemed uh, bristly walking. I would say. Want to stop for a chat? <laughs> although I, d- I did actually see uh, longer time Arsene Wenger, of course, there in his FIFA capacity, briefly, of course, forgetting my own head that speaking to Arsene in France. Uh, in a very public place, it meant he was very liable to be swarmed by people at any minute as we were actually discussing pure football matters. Not the new side rule, no doubt, Rob. We were actually discussing, I must say, it was after Emma Hayes had won the women's football tournament with the United States on Saturday, and something I talked to Emma about as well. Has a coach ever won a domestic league and an international title in the same year, actually within three months as she had? There's a quiz question. That's, that's one for your pub quiz. And of course, this season will end with, well, will we call it a big international title? Manchester City and Chelsea from England taking part. Also Real Madrid in this Club World Cup. And obviously it's vexed a lot of people, the unions and some of the, the leagues. There's the threat of the legal action over the calendar related to the expanded Club World Cup. And it's one thing that the Premier League Chief Executive, Richard Masters, has felt on more confident ground speaking out on, perhaps more so than internal domestic matters, calling out Gianni Infantino. And Tarek, you did go along to this briefing with Richard Masters this week. I was attempting some post-Olympics recovery. Yeah. Um, it's weird, just as you said, it's just suddenly football is really upon us. And you realise with these uh, briefings and the first game on a Friday night, it's so soon, um, like within five days of the close of the Olympics, football is really upon us. But yeah, as you said, it was one of the areas where, where Richard Masters, the Premier League Chief Executive, He's, he's pretty direct about, you know, and, and very clear, which is this issue of the, the fixture calendar, new competitions, particularly devised by FIFA and the congestion. And I guess his point is a lack of consultation with the other people that are involved. We've talked about this in the last you know couple of weeks about this lawsuit that the leagues and the players union have launched against FIFA's dominance, the monopoly over the calendar. And this was part of it. And again, this came up again in that meeting with Richard Masters and people were also asking him, hang on, you didn't complain that much about UEFA's expansion of the Champions League. This is the first season we're going to see this new model. And his point was, yes, but we had a dialogue with them. This was kind of discussed with FIFA. We're kind of just told what's going to happen. And the whole legal issue has been given extra spice after the Super League verdict against UEFA and FIFA in um last year, earlier this year, because that um, that's really sort of opened a lot of people's eyes to thinking that there are legal avenues which the, these international governing bodies can be challenged. It's interesting, when the uh, leagues put out their statement the other week, talking about the joining the legal action, it didn't actually directly mention the Club World Cup in it. It was, the, it was in the, the week of the Olympics starting. It didn't, you're right. But if you'd followed the letters previously... As we, we talked about, they talked about this issue of, of the Club World Cup. And, you know, this is this is a long-standing argument, long-standing debate about just player arrest. We've seen players talking about it, Rodri, some others. Diaz, the Manchester City defender, he posted what his schedule could look like uh, for the coming year. And there were very few blank spaces in that. So, so yeah, you know, this 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 is going to be an issue over... How, how football works because it is there is a lot of football there's no denying that there's so much football yeah I think it's a 48 week season potentially for Manchester City of course the European leagues joining with FIFA Pro Europe on this uh, claiming a breach of competition law as they filed a complaint to the European Commission but again still no sense how universal this support is whether it is very much tilted towards the wealthier leagues who are opposed to the Club World Cup rather than those some sort of smaller footballing territories that would actually benefit from the exposure, whether you're a club or indeed a, a player. Yeah, he didn't want to speculate, actually, on, on when this could... He said, you know, one of these cases, if it does actually go to its end, maybe it won't, maybe they'll come to an agreement that, you know, it could be years. But they've got... For him, when you're talking about legal cases, there's, there's a few more that are going to be a bit more urgent this year. So, starting with Manchester City, and we probably have mentioned this on what a lot of the pod throughout the uh, what three and a half years still no 
end, definite end date in sight for the Manchester City Premier League 115 charges case. But we do know now it will at least start to be heard by the Independent Commission in the middle of September. Yeah, mid to late September is what um, I've heard from very reliable sources. And um, the link very reliable. Of- do you ever go on something not too reliable? <laughs> The not too reliable sources are the sort of funny items in my column, you know, usually from you and Tariq. Uh, but yes, it's going to be mid to late September, unless there's fresh legal delays, but I can't see that at this late stage. And the other thing is um, it's going to last 10 weeks. So you get a couple of months for deliberations and deciding what to do because obviously it's very complex with so many charges and perhaps maybe February, end of January for an outcome and then with time for an appeal before the end of the season. So so the appeal, just so when could people expect this to end? Don't forget this started in 2018. Uh, we've had a pandemic start and finish since then. <laughs> you know, um, The, the you know, options actually of this story, if you uh, pass your mind back, was Tarek and myself in Rwanda of all things, about, about to spend an hour with Gianni Fantino, and we'd heard leaks about the leaks, about the leaks, and we asked him about it, because obviously it impacted his UA for days, and the first mention of them was us doing a story saying they were, Infantino, UEFA were braced for what these leaks might say. That's right, it was that, it was that weekend that, that we, we'd, obviously we weren't party to the newspaper consortium that, the media consortium that had access to the leaks, and we never have been, so that, that's how we, we first got got wind of this but martin in terms of how long it's gone you mentioned these dates just now and then an appeal where can they appeal so there's a is it to the premier league and then where so the they can't appeal to the court of arbitration for sport there are very limited areas of which you can appeal beyond that um to and that's to an arbitration now that's for things like um i mean on sort of the, 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 I think completely unreasonably, but I think you know you'd have to, in order to, to actually get to that arbitration, you'd have to have some fairly good evidence. So it's not going to be easy. I think if it gets to the appeal, it's probably um, about as far as it goes. Of course, the Premier League can appeal as well. So if Manchester City do win their case or the, the majority of the serious cases, then uh, um, the Premier League could appeal. What prospect a late sudden settlement on the? As this hearing's about to take place, I mean, it has happened. We've heard about it before in many different walks of life. Or is there? Is it become too far down the line that there couldn't be an assessment that sees, say, Manchester City avoid serious sanctions? I think that'd be pretty unacceptable to the rest of the clubs, to be honest. I mean, if you look at the seriousness of the charges, you know, we're talking about it doesn't get more serious in terms of football governance and club club governance to me. So apart, you know. But, Maybe match fixing is more serious, but in terms of the day-to-day compliance with the rules, I think this is as serious as it gets. Yeah, it's sort of in in very kind of using as few words as possible here. It's kind of cheating for a decade, which, you know, in terms of what competition is, what sport is, the, the sanctions have to... If, if found guilty, have to be the severest. The other interesting aspect around the, the whole time scale uh, actually ties into that November 2018 Thing when the the Der Spiegel first published those um, those football leaks, is that um, I was speaking to a, 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 somebody very experienced in sports law who who said that they, if the other clubs want to sue for compensation, Manchester with Manchester City, and we've seen this with you know over the the Everton. Profit and sustainability rules, other clubs were lodging claims. We saw it before with Sheffield United and West Ham over the Carlos Tevez affair. If they want to do that, they, they may have to lodge these claims. And that yes, this isn't in a court of law. This is in an arbitration. They, would, they may have to do that um, before the outcome of the case because um, there's a six-year statute of limitations from when you become aware of a possible breach of contract. And if that is November 2018, then they effectively need to lodge these claims before November 2024. Even if it takes longer than six years for the first sense of a breach, 
to actually get a verdict that would give you the full picture whether or not you want to choose to launch such a yeah, exactly. what, a, Crazy. what a mess i mean absolute what a bloody mess sorry guys this is absolutely <laughs> mental look at this what are we talking about so you're gonna have and if they do then you've got a whole many more years of arbitration over suing a club for how many millions of pounds in damages wow but it's not this this is what just one case of this one club what else is coming this season leicester city yeah, Leicester City, there's a profit sustainability case outstanding. Everton with a profit sustainability case outstanding. But I think Richard Masters, he referenced it in the um, Derek, which I think was going to be another really massive one, and that's Chelsea. Um, this investigation into payments during the Roman Abramovich years. Yeah, right, he did. He did, and he said, you know, that it's it's a case of Chelsea's new owners. <laughs> we, got, we could have quite a lot to say about them at another time. Um coming forward and presenting this evidence to the first to UEFA and then to the Premier League. And then it, it, this is kind of unprecedented. I can't think of another case like like this one. And this, these are over payments sort of made off the books, I suppose, and, and, and elsewhere. And then there's the case with him shadow owning that team in the Netherlands, FC um, Vitesse Arnhem, that, that has collapsed, that we, we, we talked about before. You know, this this is another one, which is, is, a, is a, you know, you wouldn't want to be Richard Masters or the lawyers at the Premier League. You just want something easy. And this, this just sounds fiendishly complicated as well, doesn't it? Yes, um, it's an extremely tricky one because I think of the new ownership. If proven, then this is sort of Manchester City. The kind of allegations that have been put against Manchester City, this would be similar. So if there's new owners, they've self-reported it, how much leeway do you give them for having done that? It's a, it's a very interesting uh, outcome of this. We know that they've they've sort of got some money held back in their accounts in case of any um, outstanding fines. They've, they've already paid a €10 million Euro fine to UEFA, Chelsea have, so it's going to be fascinating. Particularly as around the Manchester City case, that the argument is why should the players be punished if they were to be found guilty of things carried out at the higher levels of the club, which then takes you into Chelsea, which is, they would argue, not only why should the players be punished, but why should the current leadership be punished and face uh, sanctions when it was based on actions of the past? But well, it's a club. Point, if selling a it's club, a club doesn't necessarily punished. remove yourself of that sporting liability. Correct. Uh, you know, it's the club that's being punished. Look, for people who are new to football, who might not remember, I mean, Roman Abramovich changed... Modern, modern English football with his arrival, you know, the famous David Dean quote about him firing 50 pound notes out of, out of a cannon or whatever. You know, th this guy bought with a bought B O U G H T <laughs> Chelsea this whole new era. They made them one of the best teams in the world, bought huge players to the club, won enormous titles on the back of those. So, you know, it's hard to say that none of this would have happened without that financial wherewithal. And if that is now in question, in dispute, I guess there has to be some, some ramifications. Yeah. Interestingly, Bromwich himself has kept fairly quiet for the last sort of couple of years, hasn't he? Uh, popping up occasionally linked to attempts to bring uh, peace between Russia and Ukraine, but largely uh, certainly not anything publicly backing Putin, very much in the shadows. I always think maybe biding his time, hoping hoping for some re-emergence. Well, hoping that the sanctioning is going to be lifted, maybe. Um, he, he, he certainly, I think he realises that perhaps if he if he puts himself on Putin's side, then there is no going back in his sort of uh, European life. Well, that's the ownership of one Premier League club. The one that is in absolute turmoil is Everton. Whenever there seems to be a potential saver, well plan then falls apart bids keep on collapsing but now it's a quite a rare thing perhaps a transfer between clubs by an owner could john texter switch crystal palace for Ever Six, 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 Six. Your, your, your friend john texter seeks what are you gonna say Tarek and i had a very interesting half hour with john texter in london in in, uh, in march he's a, he's a fascinating guy he's not the sort of you know, He's also coming from this sort of multi-club ownership thing, isn't he? Uh, 
I think there's so he's certainly not like hasn't got the baggage that seven 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 had. No, but he does. But he does. He does carry a fair amount of baggage. He does have some no, baggage. One, no one could care the Boeing seven 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 worth of baggage that other mob had. But, but he does arrive with a reputation. It's fair to say. Yeah, I think it, I think it's quite uh, challenging for Everton um, whether they go down this road. You know, they've been burnt so many times before, haven't they? So I think they would want some real sort of financial guarantees that things aren't going to be built on loans and um, you know, securitization or what, whatever. That, well, 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 they're going to well, they're have a hard time with Texter because let's look at what he owns. Leon was bought with an enormous loan. You know, a lot of people say he overpaid for, for Leon uh, from Jean-Michel Aulas a couple of years ago. And, and that, that is from one of the private equity funds has lent him a huge amount of money. So he's heavily levered there. That's the French story. Crystal Palace, he owns 45% of. He's upset the fans there. And he said he has no interest in owning in the past uh, a Premier League club. He doesn't want to own it. He doesn't want to run one because he hasn't enjoyed owning and running the clubs he does own. Music to Everton fans' ears there, maybe? I don't know. I don't think so. And then in Brazil, my God, the stuff at Botafogo, he's accused um, referees there of match fixing. He's in court with the uh, president of the CBF there. It's just it's just a lot of John Texter. And one thing, we don't know that much, weirdly, that he's, he's everywhere, but we don't know how much actual money he's got. Is it how wealthy he is? I kept I saw again, and it's that kind of lazy shorthand, American billionaire John Texter is is poised to, to buy Everton. But I really don't think he's a billionaire. There's nothing in his business parts that suggests he is. So and again, something to watch for. That's when billionaire gets used once in the media and it just gets repeated and spread around and no one checks the original source of it. We'll be keeping an eye on Everton. Something we have talked about in the past is when we do get American celebrity investment in football clubs, particularly from the sports world, and they imply that they perhaps bought some vast stake and we're left in the shadows in terms of knowing how big that stake even is. Uh, but they get a lot of coverage around it. Um, you know, we've seen it at Burnley and certainly at Birmingham City as well. With uh, But breaking with that is uh, Ipswich Town, newly promoted back to the Premier League, announced that Ed Sheeran had acquired a Murray Norwich stake and actually did announce it was 1.4% and he wouldn't board. So some actual detail and clarity in this case. And he's, uh, of course, the sponsor of the team as well, isn't he? Is the sponsors that they're sure, and he's a genuine fan of the team. And his comments were lovely to see. Actually, this is someone who loves the team, and he's he's put his money money into that team. Yeah, it reminded me of somebody of my age. I can remember back that far, Elton John getting involved in Watford, and that was uh, turned out to be a very long term and harmonious relationship. The real love affair there between. Um... Elton John and Watford. Um, I don't know what would have attracted and how long Kevin Durant, the NBA player, has been a, a passionate fan of PSG. Uh, but he has owned, uh, bought 2% of the uh, French champions through uh, a fund controlled by Arctos. Yeah, not well, maybe it's the right time to be investing in uh, Ligue 1 at a low point, unless you think you can get any lower. Of course, with the, the right deal, a sport car point out, being a 12% decrease on the previous one for the TV rights, just showing how much the French League has struggled. And now, obviously, no Mbappe started his life at Real Madrid by, by winning the Super Cup. And also, mention France, Italy has also had struggles in terms of selling its international TV rights as well as the season begins. Shows that real gap, doesn't it, in, in Europe between perhaps La Liga and the Premier League at the top and then the rest. It's a real challenge, isn't it? Especially for French football, I think, because you know the PSG Galacticos era is over. That was a, a big driver. So if you don't have that, then I think there is going to be a struggle. Italy, maybe there's a bit, it's a bit the same. It's now becoming quite a way behind, obviously, England and Spain as well, and perhaps Germany too. There's huge challenges for those countries. How do they catch up? Particularly with uh, Saudi Arabia on the horizon and the finances on offer there and their attempts to grow the Pro League. And, you know, we're just seeing even more evidence of how they're getting involved in football this week and spreading their reach is the fact that the public investment fund, PIF, of course, owners of Newcastle United, backers of Lib Golf, have now signed up with CONCACAF. Governing body, of course, for 
North Central and South American football ahead of the World Cup in 2026 being there. Yeah, it makes complete sense that a um, sovereign wealth fund wants to brand with CONCACAF. But <laughs> the, the, the other reason will be, of course, we talked about this briefly last in the last edition about the uh, World Cup bid for 2034. There's going to be a vote of this one bidder. Might as well, you know, hand out some of the gifts before everyone gets to vote and um, make sure that, you know, all the water moves in the right direction. And we're going to see more of these sponsorship deals, no doubt. Hasn't uh, Concap already got a deal with Aramco, the Saudi oil state-owned oil company? I think they have another Saudi deal, and they're they're, they're open to as as much as possible. If 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 these if these organisations, you know, Saudi Arabia's tourism board or or Aramco or airlines want to pay Concacaf this money, I think they're happy to take it. And you know, it, it feathers their nest one way, and then you know, when it comes to decisions being taken at FIFA level, good for them. So we're just seeing it. Uh, yes, they signed a multi-year deal in February this year. And this comes down to the whole process as well. While on the one side, you might want to be the impression it is a sort of ongoing open process. On the other side, we know it's a done deal. And actually, it's probably more helpful for it to be seen as a done deal because if this was a hugely contested vote and talking about a, a contest to see who would host the World Cup, actually the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund sponsoring one of the confederations suddenly that holds key votes might be seen as more problematic as it was sort of in the you know the fallout from the 2018 2022 votes but there doesn't seem any issue with it because there are no votes to buy it's a you know behind the scenes all settled for Saudi of course while still waiting for those FIFA inspection reports and what they can click right well FIFA actually this week announced a sponsorship deal, Bank of America, for the 2026 World Cup. So maybe that's the start of the North American sponsors. And as the Olympics drew to a close, all things turned to North America and Los Angeles for 20. Disappointing maybe the fact that we didn't get the Red Hot Chili Peppers uh, in the stadium in the Stade de France. In fact, they were on a beach in LA. Something really struck me from that closing ceremony as we close up the pod with Olympic reflections was I couldn't believe that they manipulated even digitally the Hollywood sign and put the Olympic rings into it. If anyone's ever seen the IOC brand guidelines, they protect so strongly and prevent anyone manipulating them in any way. Yeah, I suppose, you know, they, they needed this Olympics to start with a bang, with a hit and get all that attention. You and I are talking about this now, those iconic Hollywood rings with the IOC rings. Maybe that, that's that's part of the, the attraction to that. And how was the closing press conference? Uh, I was actually doing another interview at the same time, but they were being quizzed in terms of LA and their handover press conference from Paris about even things like traffic and how LA will cope, building up some of those issues after a very sort of calm, largely traffic-free centre of Paris during the, the few weeks there. Well, I'm very embarrassed to say that I don't think any member of this pod attended that <laughs> press conference. However, the, the LA did say that they're going to have it or all the transport is going to be public public transport. And if you've ever been to LA, that sounds an extremely tall order. It's a city where you kind of have to have a car to get anywhere and is known for, for its gridlock. So um, this is going to be a major transformation to, you know, for LA to follow through on this promise. The other interesting thing about LA, which I think we've alluded to before, is it's going to be the, the earliest Olympics for 100 years. Um, it's going to start um, certainly a week earlier than it said in, in the bid book, and it's going to be like the second weekend in July, which potential clashes with other major sports events, Tour de France, Wimbledon, Open golf. I mean, the LA say they, they've already had conversations with the sports about that. It is, um, it's potentially a disruptor. It means that the European Championships will uh, will effectively finish four days before the opening ceremony. Well, good news for leagues like the Premier League uh, because there's even less crossover. There's a bigger gap between the start of the Premier League beginning and the end of the Olympics. But something actually that came up during the Olympics was, you know, tensions in some ways, to some degree, between FIFA and the IOC, 
IOC pushing gender equality. But the fact is the football tournament does remain larger for the men's compared to the women's. So 16 teams in the men's tournament, 12 in the women's. And also, just even more broadly, just how compact this football tournament is, how little rest time there is. And it's obviously a big ticket seller for the IOC. There's a way of fixing this. Get rid of football. It really doesn't need to be in the Olympic Games, men's or women's. We saw in Australia how big the Women's Football World Cup has become. What a what a major honour that is. The men's competition is an under-23. It's a weird event. So it's an under-23 event plus three overage players. Obviously, it's nice to win a gold medal for, for these countries. But really, really, in terms of like football honours, it, it's losing its luster in the women's area where it was seen once as the peak and for the men's it's god it's never been the peak i think fifa enjoyed having a couple of tournaments though this summer to be able to put their stamp all over but they did and i'm sure their uh, invited guests and those members we saw cruising through paris in those mercedes vans and and the you know in the hotels they were staying out off the Champs Elysees. They must have enjoyed themselves as well. So that's another opportunity for that type of thing. But really, you know, in terms of football tournament, who cares about the Olympic football tournament? Yeah, I think you're, you're certainly right. With the, the men's, it, it's uh, it's it's very lackluster. But I still think the women's actually had had much more of a sort of cachet certainly than the men's. And I, I think it would be a struggle to to get rid of that. You know, why would you keep the, men, the women's and not the men's, I suppose, would be the argument. But, you know, you're right. FIFA enjoyed it. But we, we cycled past the uh, FIFA's offices on the Place de la Concorde, didn't we, Tarek? Um, the ground rent on... Blinded by the chandelier. The ground rent on that must be extortionate. How much are they paying? I don't think they're paying. I don't think they're paying. I, I think it's an extension of the agreement they have with Qatar. So I, I'm not sure they're paying uh, um, a significant amount. And if they are paying, it might be mates' rates. Mm. Lots of pennants being handed over whenever uh, Gianni Fantina things with some people. Maybe it's something we should adopt. You meet someone, you hand over a, a pennant or a football. Yeah. Sport or not pennant? There you go. Yeah, yeah. Got, uh, cancel, cancel the pen order. We're, get, we're getting some, <laughs> some pennants. Um, yeah, badges. Plus, That's what we should have had. Of course, the, the Olympic is, badge well, swapping is still such a huge thing. Pins. Yeah. Yeah. Pins, badges. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you. you uh, yeah, sometimes it can help diffuse a, a frosty a frosty situation at, at the Olympics. Um, Although Thomas Bath did uh, himself hand over a pair of uh, Olympic ring glasses to one journalist who, uh, I think it's his final games, it, that was in the closing press conference. A bit of levity from Thomas Bath. That's Mark Van Tuyak from, from L'Equipe. And the thing with Mark is that whenever he's in a press conference... He will always demand to speak in French, as is his right. And he said, I will, and he will say it in English, I will ask my question in French. And then at that press conference where he got his, his little gift from Thomas Park, the microphone, the last question goes to Mark Van Tuyak. And uh, Mark says, I will ask my question in English. <laughs> and this kind of roar went through the, through the room. It was a very nice moment. Excellent. A bit of levity all around there. We didn't get to hear then from Thomas Bach the next day when he made that big announcement to the session that uh, been bits of speculation. Would he be asked to stay on beyond this term limit? Would he be seen to be carrying out the members' wishes? No, he said. 2025. Yes, me, I have to say. I thought things were building up that he was going to not do the whole four years, but I thought he might do two as a sort of because of the you know the COVID years or something. But yeah, it was a surprise on that. He, he'd been sort of playing, keeping it up in the air, hadn't he? For, I don't know why he decided he wanted to do that, but anyway, he did. But now opens up very interesting questions about who is going to be his successor. I think there's going to be a lot of people putting their names forward. Yes, we, we have a few already in the frame. We've got... Um... Samaranch Jr., his, his father, of course, was a longtime former president of the IOC. I think he was forced to step down after the Salt Lake City scandal in, in 2001. There's David Lapatian, who seems to be a, a Bark favoured um, official. He was head of world cycling for a while. He's an IOC member from France. Now um, leading the esports sort of uh, push with the new e games that'll be in Saudi Arabia. Correct. 
Yeah, he's part of that. And we're going to have, I think, we're finally, we're going to have some some uh, female candidates as well. Kirsty Coventry, the swimmer's name, has been mentioned. So, yeah, it should be quite a busy, busy list. And Sebastian Coe, president of World Athletics, although he could be... No, he, I think he would be OK now. Uh, I think if it had been delayed a couple of years, he he, he would have been ineligible. I, I think there may be issues around, would he have to get a extension um, once he turns 70 but um, I think he could still stand it's an interesting one the thing about Sebco is he will go for it if he thinks he's and go for it hard if he thinks he's got a, a good chance of winning you would say David Lepartien I think his being put in, in charge of the esports at Saturday is quite significant that maybe Thomas Pike sees him as his preferred successor but I might be reading too much into that and of course um, perhaps some tension created in terms of uh, any favour towards wanting um, Seb Coe to replace him over World Athletics announcing their prize money for Olympic medalists which might cause a bit of friction in the Olympic world now a lot of friction still being caused by various cases that are spilled out from the Olympics. It's not all ended with the medal ceremonies and we're already getting medals being lost. So what's happening with this gymnastics case that's gone to Cass? It is a significant moment because of what it represented as well. It was the first all-black gymnastics podium. The gold medal was won by Rebecca Andrade from, from Brazil. Silver to the great Simone Biles and Jordan Childs won a bronze medal for the United States. Now, that bronze medal was given after an appeal by her coach during the, 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 the routine. Romania appealed to said the appeal was too late and it had been deemed by the cast panel as four seconds too late. And that bronze has been taken away and given to the Romanian Anna Barbosu. But that's not the end of the story. This, this whole thing is now rumbling on. There's an appeal the U.S. gymnastics governing body, the U.S. Olympic Committee, have said the cast. This is bizarre, guys. Sent the email about the case to the wrong addresses, and they they found out two days later than they should, and only a few hours before the hearing about the case. I mean, I just don't know how you can get something like that so wrong. And then there's questions about the conflicts of interest over the chair of the three-member panel, Mr. Garavi from France, Hamid Garavi, he represents France and Iran at the CAS, but he also works for Romania in arbitration hearings at the World Bank. So there's questions about this. The CAS have said everyone knew, but the fact that these emails went to the wrong addresses means there's going to be some serious issues and there are appeals pending. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing about the conflict of interest is is very interesting. I mean, it, it, if you, it'd be interesting to know if he actually sort of announced that beforehand or if that just emerged, you know, he did. through investigations. No, no, he did. Was... No, he, he did. did. No, the thing is that, yeah, the part of the Cassio is that you have to, you have to say if you're conflicted in any way, mm. but the parties then have a right to say, hang on, we have an issue with this and, and it should, you should find a new chair. But and did they? also, they didn't know for two days because they sent the, the stuff to the wrong, the wrong email address uh, as well. So it was, for them, it was very... And also, the fact he's so conflicted, I talked to an expert in this, I said, even if they didn't, even if they didn't say that we have a problem, this man should never be in charge given how conflicted he is. Those are the rules of normal arbitration. And very often, the perception of a conflict is enough for that deemed a conflict of interest. I, I mean, it seems incredible we're talking about a matter of seconds here we know gold can be determined in some cases on the athletics track by thousands of a second but talking about whether appeal came in four seconds too late or 13 seconds beyond the deadline uh, certainly that's... hopefully we've stayed within the margin of error and within the deadlines for for this pod but one <laughs> big case still to mention is area knighton and this has sparked another dispute between the us and China in the ongoing sort of doping battles because it's all about why did the US Anti-Doping Agency announce a no-fault finding despite the fact that uh, NITA tested positive and yet he was cleared. They did find that he had been positive for a banned drug 
Tenbalone, which is found in livestock, is linked to contamination cases over the years. And they accepted that the oxtail apparently he'd eaten from a bakery in Florida was in fact contaminated. So he was able to, you know, qualify and then finish fourth in the 200 meters in Paris. And the fact that the USADA statement itself starts to raise why they handled this differently from the Chinese case shows how sensitive they are to just pointing out their transparent saying China hasn't been on their contamination cases in swimming. Yeah, and the Chinese, the Chinese were very quick to jump on this case as well. This is this has become very political between between certainly for China on this side and the and the Americans with WADA and on that side. The the issue, as you said, Rob, it's all been announced, and this is how the process in a way should work. That if the tribunal got it wrong, the ARU should be able to appeal it to CAST and it should be known publicly. And and Knighton now faces that. That is the, the the difficulty is though he did appear on the track at the Olympics, finishing fourth in the two hundred meters. Now, if he is then banned, imagine he won the gold medal. Well, what do you say then? Well, indeed. Well, that, I think that's going to be a theme, isn't it, in the in the coming years, particularly building up to even the Salt Lake City Winter Games in the in twenty thirty four and. The stipulation, the fact that the Americans have to lobby against the uh, anti-doping legislation that exists, maybe to protect those games. But as we wrap up, we end with some breaking news. Breaking. Well, it's certainly not taking place in the Los Angeles games. And you barely noticed it existed in Paris because it was shoehorned in right at the end. But it managed to squeeze itself in at the end, but provide all the chatter in the days after the closing ceremony. Yeah, Raygun, the famous kangaroo breaking. Uh, I mean, I'm sure everyone's seen it. Um, I mean, the, the Australian breaking contestant is facing accusations that she sort of manipulated her position as head of the governing body for breaking in Australia to get herself selected. But where she got no point, I think, in Paris. Yeah, I mean, it's worth watching the video in the YouTube. That said, you know, there's 14,000 athletes, I think, at the Olympics. Now, how do you get yourself noticed? I think Ray Gunn has done a very good job. The fact we know who, who she is for a start. I don't know how many million views those videos have had. Uh, you know, on the other side, there's a darker part to this because she's got a lot of hatred on, online and all the rest of it. But and, and look, this is probably one way of making sure that break dancing or breaking, whatever you want to call it, is not going to stay in the Olympics long term. Yeah. And ultimately, actually, it came down to an issue that is, you know, hang over these games, you know, whether it is over her, Iman Khalifa, about this toxicity of online abuse. Very different cases, but just the... Uh, ses- yeah, well, we all know about that, don't we, guys? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, maybe not the best place to say you can message us on there, but, you know, we are on all the social nets, we're on Locked On there, uh, X. Facebook, Instagram, and and on threads as well. Do remember to post in there. Sometimes on TikTok as well. Rob, uh, yeah, well thanks for opening up. So any, anything you want to throw at us? Rob's got his own one. So any of the abuse, <laughs> send it that way. <laughs> and thank you everyone for listening. Goodbye for now.